Hi, and welcome back to the Shane Plays White Plume Mountain note series from Tales from the Yawning Portal, where D&D Wizards of the Coast updated seven classic adventures for 5th edition, and we're going through White Plume Mountain. Uh, thanks so much for watching. If you're a new viewer, I appreciate it. What I basically do with these videos is recap my previous sessions each week with my players at my friendly local game store as we go through this adventure, give my notes on the adventure, kind of D&D notes in general, RPG notes and thoughts, and then just, you know, kind of try to give some insight into how I th do things as a dungeon master. So I hope you enjoy the video. If you're a returning viewer, I really appreciate you very much. Uh, this is a, a very highly engaged video series for the, you know, the comments and the interactivity. Um, and it just has a good, solid, consistent viewership. So I really appreciate you if you're a returning viewer. Um, and so with all that said, uh, let's let's press on. So what happened uh, the previous session, we'll get into here in a moment. Uh, I'll talk about one thing, then we'll do the viewer feedback, and then we'll go into the full, you know, full-blown recap. But I wanted to talk about uh, bags of holding, you know, the, the, the infamous and famous and much beloved uh, bag of holding that that has been a staple, almost a trope, if you will, of D and D, you know, since since way back in the in the late 70s and in, in the early 80s and all that. So we got into a discussion of the nature of of a bag of holding. Uh, there's actually two bags of holding in this party. One was acquired through adventuring. Another one, if you'll remember, at the beginning of the series. Uh, White Plume Mountain, um, because the players are going in a couple of lowers, low levels lower than the uh, the recommended eighth level. They're coming in at sixth level. I let I let them do some random magic item rolls, and and another bag of holding entered the party. Anyway, so we got to talking about bags of holding because of ten foot poles, right? Ten foot pole. The, it's been a staple of adventures of D&D since the beginning, especially back when D&D was basically just dungeon crawls. That's what D&D was, and everything was 10 by 10 and corridors and this and that and the other. And so a 10-foot pole was a very important part of adventuring gear for D&D, and, and White Plume Mountain is very much a dungeon crawl. So, you know, I had told the players that when they were first getting equipped, uh, to go into White Plume Mountain, you know, I made no, you know, bones about this. I said, this is a classic dungeon crawl. Think of it in those terms, and it also be, can be quite dangerous. So they got the typical traditional dungeon, dungeoneering equipment, adventuring gear, including 10-foot poles. Well, the other night, um, because they were preparing, they had left White Plume Mountain, and they were at a village and preparing to go back in. There's just like this little really podunk village a few miles from White Plume Mountain, they were preparing to go back in, and we were talking about supplies and everything. I said, how many 10-foot poles do you have? And I remember they had a few. And I was told 20. So I'm like, 20 poles? <laughs> They're like, yeah. And I remember they told me they'd, they'd bought in a few, but 20. I was like, okay. So 20 10-foot poles, that's that's no joke. Uh, and, and, and not only is it approaching, a, you know, a little ludicrous metagaming, area but but anyway I, I was like okay i said where who's carrying these 10 foot poles and and you know that sort of thing and they're like well they're in the bags of holding and i said well okay are they so we went and looked and you know i, I i've been playing D, D for decades different i didn't play fourth edition but i played every other edition and you know i've never really sat down and thought about now the bag of holding comes out can somebody go in it and you know does it have to fit through the lip to get in and, 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 and all this stuff? But I never really thought about the, or if I had, I'd forgotten about it, the, the actual, what the volume inside the bag of holding looks like. So let's, let's take a look real quick at what the Dungeon Master's Guide has to say about the bag of holding for 5th edition. And then we'll talk about, you know, kind of the discussion we had in the group. And so this is on page 153 and 154 in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Uh, this is the bag of holding. It's a wondrous item, and it's uncommon, even though we, we happen to have two in our uh, group. And, you know, there's just a, a lot of groups out there have them. Like I said, it's almost a trope. Uh, 
This bag has an interior space considerably larger than its outside dimensions, roughly two feet in diameter at the mouth and four feet deep. Now, I'm wondering, does that, does that mean that the, uh, that the, it looks like, like if I'm looking at it on the outside, it's two feet wide and four feet deep? Because I've never thought of it that big, uh, physically. And, you know, the picture that they have in the Dungeon Master's Guide certainly doesn't look like it's four feet deep. Now, I understand that these pictures are, you know, kind of creative and that sort of stuff. It doesn't necessarily reflect the rules. Um, the bag can hold up to 500 pounds, not exceeding a volume. The volume is the three-dimensional space uh, area is just length times width. Uh, can hold up to 500 pounds, not exceeding a volume of 64 cubic feet which means it's, you know, it's area, it's cubed. Uh, the bag weighs 15 pounds regardless of its contents. Retrieving an item from the bag requires an action. And I don't see anything in the rules here, but I've heard, you know, different people debate over, you know, does it have to fit in the lip to get in? I would kind of rule maybe yes. Um, and also, you know, I've heard you just put your hand in and think about what you want and you just find it and pull it out. That doesn't, it's not specifically stated here, but I mean, if you're messing with a magical, you know, basically TARDIS bag, um, then, you know, I, I don't have any problem with saying, well, I'm just, I just grab what I want and pull it out. If the bag is overloaded, pierced or torn, it ruptures and it is, and it is destroyed and its contents are scattered in the astral plane, not the material plane, not the prime material plane. If the bag is turned inside out, its contents spill forth unharmed, but the bag must be put right again before it can be used again. Put, put right before it can be used again. Breathing creatures inside the bag can survive up to a number of minutes equal to 10 divided by the number of creatures, minimum one minute, uh, after which time they begin to suffocate. Placing a bag of holding inside an extra dimensional space created by Heward's Handy Haversack portable hole. I love the portable hole. I don't know why, I just always have. Or similar inst item instantly destroys both items and opens a gate to the astral plane. The gate originates where the one item was placed inside the other. Any creature within 10 feet of the gate is sucked through it to a random location on the astral plane. The gate then closes. The gate is one way only and can't be reopened. So those are the rules for the bag of holding. Now, 64 cubic feet is basically just purely mathematical. It's It's four feet squared it's roughly what four feet by four feet by four feet it's a it's a four foot cube right so uh you know but the question is does the does the bag adapt itself to whatever's put in like let's say that i have something that's eight foot long you know and two feet wide well, that's that's not as that's not larger than 64 cubic feet. Well, that cubic feet. Well, that just go in the bag, or does that ex exceed the cubic area? You know, can can this can the does the space inside the bag of holding need to be a cube, or can it be can it be a rectangle? Can it be amorphous? I don't know, but we kind of debated at the table, and we kind of landed on it's it's kind of a cubic space. So the bottom line was, is that you can't put, we said you can't put a 10 foot pole into a bag of holding. I, I, I guess it's possible. I don't know that you could rule that you could stick it in there and a couple of feet or sticking out or something. I don't know, but I, I kind of feel like it's either all or nothing, whether something goes into a portable hole or a bag of holding or not. So I, I'd love to, I'd love your feedback and comments on that because it's a very popular magic item. That can be used well, but it can also be abused. And I feel like, uh, I don't think the party was trying to abuse, but I just I think they just thought, hey, we're just sticking them in the bags of holdings. But really, 20 10-foot poles is kind of crazy. So, you know, I got, I got after having that discussion, I got very exacting. I said, how many poles do you have and who's carrying them? Uh, and it kind of came down to, because uh, they were going back in, and it kind of came down to the bard had one. The warrior had one, and the rogue has one. So they got three 10-foot poles at this point. And they've they've lost four or five 10-foot poles in this adventure for traps and this, and like the heated metal corridor and some other stuff. You know, they've lost some 10-foot poles. Um, and the rogues is actually collapsible. I don't know if I remember, I don't know if I mentioned this in the very first video for the series, but the rogue player had actually asked me, you know, uh, 
can I get a couple a collapsible 10 foot pole? And I said, yeah, but I charged him. I mean, it was much more than the regular 10. Because the 10-foot pole is a 10-foot pole, not a big deal. But he wanted this collapsible thing. And so I guess it's three foot long because it collapses. I guess that one could go in a portable hole or a, a bag of holding. Um, I got portable holes on the brain all of a sudden. I need that like a hole in the head. <laughs> okay, sorry. So anyway, uh, so, you know, we got very exacting on that. And then I, I highlighted, so okay, I said, let's let's think about this. I said, last session, you guys were running around uh, carrying kayaks, I think like three kayaks, uh, three bodies, and you had 20 10-foot poles. You're, I said, it's just, that's just, you know, even for a fantasy RPG, that's getting a little, you know, kind of, so, uh, so that's kind of the discussion we had. Love to hear your thoughts and feedback on that. And maybe even interesting portable hole stories because that port, portable hole bag of holdings or even portable hole bag of holding stories, because they've been used very uniquely. Like I was saying a minute ago, they can be very helpful, but they can also be abused. Um, they can be, you know, power gamed or whatever, or meta gamed. And, and, and so I'm, I'm curious to hear, you know, your thoughts on kind of how, I went to it. So with that being said, let's get to the ever popular viewer feedback. All right. So I'm going to put on my plus three spectacles of viewer feedback and let's see what the sending, the magical sending stones have brought us this week. So here we go. Okay. Uh, first uh, feedback is from Leonardo Matthias and, or Matthias maybe. And he, 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 commented on hold person because I, I talked a little bit about that last video and Leonardo said to counter hold person you can have some of your monsters and antagonists, antagonists carry dispel magic and freedom of movement scrolls or have clerics slash shamans that can cast it rings of free action also do the trick but they may become treasure afterwards so true like if you give if you're like ah give the monster a ring of free action and like they kill the monster now, suddenly your party's got a ring of free action. So keep, you know, if, assuming they get it as treasure. So think about that. Leonardo also went an extra step here and put in a list of monsters that are immune to the paralyzed condition. He put in a link from a uh, filtered search result from D&D &D Beyond. Uh, so I really appreciate that extra step there, Leonardo. And and I said, good thoughts. If every fight turns into hold person time, I will incorporate some of that. Also, thanks for the list of monsters. What I was talking about last video, I was just kind of thinking out loud. I wasn't going to take hold person away from the uh, uh, party. It's, you know, they've earned it. It's in their bag, their toolkit, their bag of tricks, if you will, uh, their, their skills and whatnot they can do. But they're, for two sessions in a row, uh, an encounter was basically drastically changed by uh, whole person being successfully cast. So I was thinking, you know, when, uh, when should I kind of step in on that? Uh, and it's a kind of reply to Leonardo. It's, you know, if it just becomes every session, it's just whole person, whole person, whole person, then, you know, we may, I may, may kind of go that route, but those are good thoughts. And I definitely don't want to take whole person away from the party. It, it wasn't to that extent. I was just kind of thinking out loud, which I'll do on these videos. Sometimes I'll be like, Oh, and I'm not, I don't even have something I prepared to say. I just kind of start thinking out loud because I want to give insight to a lot of people give feedback to, Hey, these videos are helpful to me as a DM. I'm just trying to give insight into how I do things. I'm by no means perfect as a DM. Um, it, but I do enjoy doing it, and I feel that I'm getting better over time. So, Don Reum uh, commented again. Thanks, Don. And he said, congrats on the 1,000 subscribers. Thank you, Don. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, we, we've gone over 1,000 subscribers on the channel, and I, I kind of celebrated that last video. I appreciate all of you. I really enjoy doing these videos, and I'm glad they're helpful to you. So, um, you know, thank you. Uh, we're, you know, Right, is I'll keep making them as long as people keep enjoying them. So uh, Don said, me, myself, I love it when my group goes, look, squirrel, and goes off the rails. Those are some of my funnest sessions for me and my players. Laugh out loud. Absolutely. He's talking about last session, my my group totally, they were like, squirrel, um, on, the, on the knights that were left over from Sir Bluto on the kayaks. And then they also decided, uh, two of my players were like, hey, uh, let's ride a kayak across the frictionless floor in the fric frictionless floor room and smash into the opposite wall and see what happens. So, you know, it got a little bit off the rails, 
but we had fun, you know, and, and, and I said, Squirrel can indeed lead to some great gaming memories. Uh, some of the best memories are, are just that crazy, weird stuff that, that happens. Um, so I agree with that, Don. Thanks. Uh, Rob Plummer, who's a, a very active member of this channel, um, comments quite often, said, congrats, Shane, on 1,000 subscribers. This is a great series. And uh, thanks, Rob. And again, thank you for your involvement. You've been very active, and I appreciate it. And you've had some great thoughts. Mike Fuller says congrats on a thousand subs again thank you mike uh he says i've been subscribed since the start of your out of the abyss uh and and love the vids so yeah a lot of the people kind of that are watching white plume mountain i think kind of got started on my channel with uh out of the abyss and we're as a reminder we're just on a break from out of the abyss we did part one and now we're on white white plume mountain kind of at halftime if you will and we will do part two of Out of the Abyss after White Plume Mountain is finished here in a few weeks. So he went on to say, okay, I would take the kayak jumping as a personal challenge as a DM. So this dungeon is supposed to be a killer, in quotes, and they obviously don't feel afraid. To reinforce my desired atmosphere, I would take off the kid gloves for the last two thirds of the dungeon. With a party of six to seven PCs, which that's about what we run, in our group right now. It is criminal, in my humble opinion, to dumb down encounters. It really cheapens their accomplishments if they are rarely challenged. So I agree with that, um, Mike, uh, that, you know, in fact, I said last video, I think I said this, that, you know, I had told my players, I said, look, I've gone through a third of the dungeon and, you know, I've been kind of gauging how how capable you are giving that you're only six level and the dungeon is rated for eighth level or above or designed for that. And, you know, you've been doing really, really well. So, you know, we did have one player die, but was revived. Uh, we've had other players knocked unconscious. Uh, but for the most part, they've done well, you know, nobody's died yet. Although, you know, we did have that person that if revivify hadn't been cast, they would have been gone, uh, from Quesnov's cone of cold. And then of course, Sir Bluto's fight is pretty tough and I had taken it, it was supposed to be Sir Bluto in eight nights, and I took it to four nights, and, you know, they did pretty well, and at that point, I decided from this point forward, I'm going to let the adventure be the adventure as written for the encounters, so I told the players that straight up, I said, look, I'm not out to get you, uh, but I'm going, you've done well, and, you know, this is, this is a, a classic dangerous dungeon, plus there's great rewards here, you know, you've got um, legendary weapons in here, you know, they've got Black Razor, Wave, and Whelm, the Trident, Wave, and Whelm, the Warhammer, and, and, and XP, and Loot, and all this other stuff. So, yeah, from this point forward, and like I said, I've told them that, that, you know, it's going to be as written. I'm not going to adjust it any further or, or, or any longer. So, Mike, appreciate your feedback. I can't remember if you've I, – I feel like that's the first time you've commented, but if you've commented it before, regardless, I appreciate your feedback. So, um, now – Ethan uh, commented on video six, but I want to I want to circle back to this because um, I want to highlight Ethan here. Uh, he said, hi, Shane. Thanks for the clarification about your fumble rules. It's an interesting take on it. I once had a DM who had penalized fumbles by making you making you re-roll the attack against yourself or a nearby ally. But I didn't like that. So personally, I tend to just have the attack miss or the check fail. Um, okay, so talking about, you know, he had asked for clarification on my fumble rules. And, and, and I said, yeah, for me personally, if somebody gets a multi-attack, whether it's a monster, an enemy, or a player, uh, NPC, whatever, if they have a multi-attack situation and they fumble at any point in the multi-attack, they don't get any further. So if they get three attacks and they fumble on the first one, they don't get their others. That's just how I do fumbles with multi-attacks. Um, and so now he, you know, Ethan brought up, and this is something I'm pretty sure back, like when I was in like junior high and high school, I'm pretty sure this is how we did it, that if you fumbled, you might have a chance to hit, I think you re-rolled or something, and you might hit the person next to you, like even your ally or whatever. Um, I'm not a big fan of that. Now, at the time, I'm sure it was fine, but now I'm just not a big fan of that. But if, if another DM does it that way, that you know, that's fine. Uh, as long as the group, everybody, you know, it goes, everybody's enjoying themselves and nobody's like super upset about it, you know, time after time. Um, a lot of DMing is finding the ins and the outs of your 
You know, every group has their own dynamics. So what might work with one group may or may not lead to a very good good time for, every, for another group. So you got to kind of feel that out, too. Um, but anyway, I, I usually don't do that. Now, if there's a good narrative reason or if, the, if there's a certain specific situation where that just totally makes sense, I, I would let that happen. But as a rule, every fumble to have a chance to smack somebody next to you like an ally, I, I probably wouldn't go with that. Now, I will take this opportunity to highlight my favorite fumble of all time. And this actually comes from uh, Iron Crown Inter Enterprises has the Rollmaster games. And that was a very crunchy fantasy role-playing game system compared to D&D back in the day. I mean, it was just much, a lot more tables, a lot more this, a lot more realism, flexibility, whatever. And they had these great fumble tables uh, and, and, and crit tables and, and all this stuff. And, and they did this game called Middle Earth Role-Playing, which is still one of my favorite rule sets to this day. Um, and Middle Earth Role-Playing was from Iron Crown Enterprises, and it was sort of an adapted version of the Rollmaster games and or rules role master was a set, a set series of rule books they had the you know the i think like uh iron law and sword law and, and like magic law or something i'm getting it wrong but it was it was cool how they did it now uh my favorite all-time fumble is from the middle earth role playing and this was also i think in role master but they adapted it slightly for uh middle earth role playing merp and uh this i i i I am not making this up. This is true. When you fumbled or, or crit or whatever, you rolled percentile dice. And if you rolled 97 through 99 when you fumbled uh, on uh, in Merp, you would, and I quote, stumble over an unseen imaginary deceased turtle. You are very confused <laughs> and you're stunned for three rounds. That's my favorite fumble of all time. Uh, and and I, I was out there looking around for this particular fumble and there's blog posts dedicated to this fumble other people remember it really well too so um and there's some all funny ones in here bite and swallow tongue in the excitement lose your grip on your weapon in reality um you lose your wind and realize that you should try to relax so it's just some really funny funny fumbles in here so i just wanted to take that moment to share that now uh, i also wanted to highlight ethan here um he said you are correct, because I had mentioned, I said, I think that, you know, Ethan streams D&D &D, uh, from Antiheroes Anonymous. And he said, you're correct. I post comments from my personal account, which is Ethan D. Uh, but the channel for the stream I do with my friends is Antiheroes Anonymous. Our first episode of White Plume Mountain is up now, so please do, do go check it out if you have the time. They ended up taking the left path towards Black Razor as well, but only made it as far as the frictionless room. I'd love to hear any feedback you have on it if you do get a chance to check it out. We're not pro streamers by any means. Guess what? Neither am I. I'm not even really a pro YouTuber, whatever that is. Uh, but I, I definitely enjoy doing it. Um, we're not pro streamers, by any, pro streamers by any means. So any feedback is always welcome. Okay, so Ethan, I did go watch uh, the first video of your White Plume Mountain. And folks, you can go to... Go to the comments. This is on video six, not video seven. Go to the comments. And Ethan D, it's Ethan space D is his YouTube name. You can click on that. And then if you go there, you'll find Antiheroes Anonymous, or I guess you can probably just search for Antiheroes Anonymous. And they stream, I think it's from Roll20. I don't, it might be on Twitch, but I think it's a Roll20 game that they're doing. Uh, and Ethan, I enjoyed watching it. Uh, I think you have a good group. They seem like they're having fun, good mix of personalities. Um, I really liked how you did the Sphinx, uh, you know, that's sort of at the three-way junction, the Andro Sphinx, the female Sphinx. Um, I, I really, uh, is it Andro Sphinx? Anyway, I really liked how you handled her and the personality you gave her and how you did the riddles. And I like the fact that after they solved the riddle, she was like, oh, uh, would you like double or nothing? You can, you know, I can ask you a riddle. And if you answer it, I will give you a clue or important information about the dungeon ahead. And if you, if you don't get it, I, I get dinner kind of, I really like that. That's not in the book. And, 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 and you did that really well. Uh, I enjoyed watching how you, how your party kind of did different from mine and, you know, handling the, the pit that drops in the water and the heated metal room 
um, and the ghouls. I loved how you described the ghouls. I thought that was really good. Um, and then, you know, how you did the, when they got the frictionless room and all that, I enjoyed it. Um, you know, so people, I would, I would, uh, encourage you to go check out Anti-Heroes Anonymous, but again, kudos. I, I really liked how you handled the Sphinx. Okay. So, um, Cody Lloyd, who is, I actually gave a shout out to a couple of weeks ago. I had met at, I was at Little Rock Comic Con doing my radio show and Cody came up, uh, with what I thought was his son. I even said his son, but it's his little brother. Sorry about that, Cody. Oops. I, I guess I just figured you were a very young father. Um, but anyway, I think that's super cool that you're playing D&D &D with your brother. Uh, I know brothers and stuff that have grown up and have become adults and, and their D&D &D as kids bond, you know, they're, they're bonded more together because of that. So I think that's great. Um, so Cody said um, on video seven, and he, and he also commented on some previous videos as well. Uh, you know, as, as he was watching his way through, um, he said he appreciated the shout out. Hey, you're welcome, man. Anytime somebody sees me out and about, come up and say hi, and I'll give you a shout out. So uh, Cody said, I'm now caught up with your notes series. I've enjoyed every, and we're back to video seven now on the comments. I've enjoyed every episode and looking forward to the next one, which I'm sure is coming real soon. I really like how you take the time to go through all of your comments at the beginning of each video, it really gives a personal connection with the viewer. I mean, I really enjoy doing that, and I think it's a cool thing to do. Uh, I'm glad that, you know, that you like it, Cody. I, I think if somebody takes the time to comment, I want to have a conversation with them. And it also leads into some inter interesting discussions on the channel that we wouldn't other otherwise have, that I wouldn't think to bring up. But people comment on stuff, it's like, oh, well, let's take a look at that, and then it, you know, it kind of kind of snowballs from there. So I appreciate everybody that comments. Um, you know, and I, I will try unless it gets to the point where, you know, doing all the viewer comments would take like three hours or something. And I'm not saying it's going to get there. I'm just saying I may at some point have to be selective. But right now I try to respond to everything in the video itself, not just on the comments on the on the YouTube page. Um, I know I have already asked you this in person, but thought it might help someone else. What advice would you have for a new DM who has been asked to run games at their local game store? So, uh, first of all, my number one advice, now this has changed over the years. I probably years ago would have said, learn the rules. Now I'm just saying, have fun and make sure everybody else is having fun. Make sure that everybody at the table gets a moment to shine, have fun, know the rules, but you don't have to obsessively know the rules. I'm still learning 5e as I go. Sometimes situations come up in the, in the, in the, in the course of a, of a session where, we all, my whole table and myself, we learn something new about the rules. Don't be afraid to just make a ruling to keep the game going and then move on. Uh, and then if you find out later that you need to change that ruling, just be honest with your players. Say, hey, I ruled this way this one time, but I've done some further research. from. So from this point forward, we're going to do it this way. Now, if you house rule or if you change things, that's fine. Every DM does, but I would encourage you to be consistent. And I'm not trying to contradict what I just said about, you know, you can go change things later. I'm just saying if you if you if you house rule something for player A, let player B do it the same way unless there's a really good reason why not. And make sure to explain. Say, OK, I'm just going to to keep the game moving. I'm going to rule this way. But, you know, it may be different next time or, or something like that. Main thing, have fun. If you're playing in a game store, you, you talk about the local game store. Make sure you understand what the expectations are from the game store or whatever. Uh, and I play a little bit looser at a game store because I'm playing on behalf of the game store to help the game store. Uh, and also just cause it's fun and it's a good, you know, people come up there, get to meet new people gotten, you know, to be good friends with uh, good friendly terms with, with my players. Uh, but I'm a little bit looser on what I allow, like in my own personal campaign in my house, I may be, slightly stricter on setting or classes or races or this or that or the other because I'm an old Tolkien grognard. But at the store, I let a lot more fly because I want the players to have fun. Um, also remember that you're there to have fun too. You're a player too. So one of the best pieces of advice I can give as a DM or a GM is you are not there at the beck and call of the players. You're there to make sure everybody has a good time and tell a good story and referee and let things unfold. But you should be having fun, too. You know, I, I think that some players think that the DM is just 
you know, like a slot machine, you pull the arm on the DM and stuff comes out and the DM is just there to provide the entertainment. No, you're there to have fun too. So it's okay to say, you know, I don't want to do things this particular way because that would ruin my enjoyment. And if I'm not enjoying myself, why do I want to come every week? So just, you know, I would give you that advice as well. Now, and, and like I said, don't be afraid to just make a ruling and move on. And, and another thing I'll say, and I could do a whole video on this. So, I mean, I could just keep going and going, but I'm going to, going to kind of rein it in so we can move forward. The best way to tell if you're doing a good job as a DM, in my opinion, are your players coming back every week? If they're coming back every week, they're having a good time. You can ask your players, take polls, whatever. They're like, yeah, it's great. Da, da, da. But they maybe just be saying that to be nice and polite and not hurt your feelings. Because you say, that's the best game I've ever had. And then they don't show up next week. You know, now sometimes happens people's move or work schedules change or they get married or go to school or whatever and they can't keep coming. But for the most part, if your players are showing up every week, you're doing good. That's that's some good advice I could give you. Like I said, I could give more, but uh, that that's enough right now. So I I would encourage you to do it if that's you know the situation you're in. Uh, you know, jump in. We need more DMs, um, and you know it's 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 fun and it's rewarding. It's fun to play. But I've gotten to where I think I enjoy DMing as much, if not more, than playing. Although I do like to take a break and play sometime at conventions and special events. So that's it for the viewer feedback. I'm gonna take off my plus three spectacles of viewer feedback, and then we will get to what actually happened in the most recent session. So here we go. Okay, so at the end of last session, they had left. Um, they left a kayak at the bottom of the spiral staircase, exited the mountain, and went back to the village and gave Sir Bluto's body, the body of two of Sir Bluto's knights, and the live knight, Patrick, Sir Bluto's follower, to the local constable, sheriff, whatever, and the villagers had also seen that Uzumaki, the fighter, the oriental style female fighter, is wearing black razor on her back. So the, the village is like, whoa, um, you know, they made a pretty grand return. You know, keep in mind that the villagers are used to, uh, you know, adventuring companies coming in because White Plume Mountain is famous. As you know, as I established it, adventurer, you know, they heard about the in the in the Yawning Portal Inn. And, and, you know, the, it's, it's legendary and adventuring parties keep trying to tackle it and failing. So it's, it's kind of a, almost a Holy Grail kind of, you know, dungeon in, in uh, the Forgotten Realms is the way I've established it, established it. It's actually, you know, I changed it so that it's not go recover these weapons for these local important people. Cause those important people are long dead and gone. You know, the weapons have been there for hundreds of years, dozens, decades, whatever. Um, so I, I gave it a slightly different, you know, um, setup. But anyway, so people come to this village and they go in and the village is used to seeing adventure parties either not come back, in which case they just kind of keep their valuables and their horses and stuff. Um, and, or they come back and they've gotten their butt kicked and they're bedraggled and beat up and probably some party members are dead. That's usually what happens. Nobody has come back yet with a weapon out of White Plume Mountain and, and this party looks like it's in pretty good shape. So they're like, wow. Um, you know, and, and, and which is going to be good and possibly bad for the party, uh, which I'll talk about here in a moment. So, uh, you know, story-wise. So the village was like, wow, the, the sheriff, the constable, is like this Sir Bluto thing. Like this is a really well-known bad guy, nobility, this and it's a big deal. Uh, so he's like, I'm in over my head with this. And he dispatches a message message to whoever his next up higher up would be in the, you know, the law enforcement of the forgotten realms in that area or whatever. I mean, this is originally from Greyhawk, uh, which would have had a slightly different thing than, than the forgotten realms, but I'm just assuming he's a very minor, you know, he's basically old Bob who is, you know, he's the constable kind of thing and maybe receives a very minor stipend and occasionally has to get involved in very minor disputes in the small town. Well, now he's been got a huge hot potato, which on one hand, it's a, it's a big thing for him, but on the other hand, it's, it's way out of his league. So he's dispatched for instructions, really saying help. <laughs> and Pat, Sir Patrick is in the one jail cell. The villagers, again, are very impressed with Sir Blue, this is Sir Bluto. Look what this party did, and also they've got Black Razor, uh, and and you know it appears that word is going to spread about the reappearance of Black Razor. 
you know, that's just, you know, there's people talking about it like crazy and you do get occasional merchants and others coming in or to the town and leaving and that sort of thing. And, you know, it's, it's this, this town gets a small town gets a little extra traffic because of the white plume mountain thing, you know, um, occasionally adventurers come through and stuff like that. So not to mention merchants and whatnot. So, um, anyway, word about black razor is going to spread. Now what I have, and I made that pretty clear, you know, just them sitting around the common room in the end, you know, that, uh, you know, they could just tell, boy, this is going to get out. You know, what they don't know, what I didn't tell them is also, you know, if you've got a local dungeon, famous dungeon that has three vow- very powerful legendary weapons in it, and adventurers keep trying to tackle it, there's a very good chance that people have come through, have, have told certain villagers, hey, if, if anything happens, get word to me and I'll reward you. So that kind of word is also going to get out too. The party doesn't know that, but I'm still trying to decide how I want to set up the end game of White Plume Mountain, and that could come into play. I'm not sure yet. I'm still thinking that through. So um, the village gave the party free room and board and rations. They gave them free room and board and some rations to go back in to White Plume Mountain because they're very impressed with this party of adventurers, but also they want to curry favor with them, right? They're like, hey, they might survive. They may, they, they may be end up being really important people. We want to re- want them to remember us fondly. So they're, they're kind of helping them out that way. Now, on shopping in the village, I, you know, I had uh, been pretty clear at the beginning, said the very first session of White Plume Mountain with my party, they never even made it into the mountain. They heard about the, uh, the dungeon while they were at the Yawning Portal Inn, they decided to come, they came to the village, they got all set up, got all ready to go, they got all the backstory, got all the exposition, and I had said this village, you know, I said, get everything you want, like, I think they were in Waterdeep, I can't remember off the top of my head where the Yawning Portal is, I think it's Waterdeep, I could be wrong, but I said, you can get anything you want in Waterdeep, when you get out to this small village, you may or may not be able to get stuff there, and, you know, when they got there again, I reminded them that, you know, when it comes to the, the standard adventuring gear table, they may or may not have stuff, and it may or may not be at the normal prices. So uh, so now they, they're wanting to go shopping, and uh, these are kind of some things I said based on stuff that was asked for. Now, rope, including silk, I just said it's available at the regular price. That's just in the village. Uh, a player asked for a grappling hook, and I gave that a 50% chance, and we rolled percentile dice, and there was no grappling hook. Uh, now, keep in mind that they didn't say, can I have one made? They just said, can I buy one? Uh, you know, if they just said, I want to ask the blacksmith or whatever to make me a grappling hook, I have said, okay, it'd take a few days. And, you know, maybe the next time they come out of White Plume Mountain, because they're kind of going in, coming out, going in. And, and, it, and it even says in the, in the adventure that, you know, parties will do that. They'll go in, come back out, go back in. Um, so... No grappling hook. Asked about holy water. I gave that a 30% chance. I don't even know if they have a, you know, I'm just saying, I don't even know if they have a regular cleric in this in this town. Uh, so 30% chance, did not find holy water. Now the rogue asked, can I find a vial of poison? And the way I handled this, I'm not sure that I handled it fairly, uh, given the other character I was saying do percentile dice roll. But I said, okay, give me a deception check. So to see if you can pass signals in the common room of the tavern in the evening and see if anybody else picks up on that and kind of signals you back in that kind of thieves, you know, can't language, finger signals, whatever. Uh, And I gave it a DC 15 and he made that check. So I said, yeah, somebody else responds to you. And I just said, you can buy poison, but it's at 125% of the standard cost. Now, what I think what I should have done in retrospect was, okay, you've made contact. Now here's the chance to get some poison and have them do the percentile dice. But instead, I just did it by that difficulty check. I wanted it to feel roguey. I wanted him to get that kind of, that moment to shine as a rogue. This is kind of a cool rogue moment. So not a huge thing here or there, but you know, I kind of feel like if I wasn't a little bit unfair to that other player, I was making do percentile dice. Although there was a role involved with the DC-15. So they, they stayed, you know, like... They got there back in the day, stayed the night, and the next day mounted up to go back to White Plume Mountain. So they got, you know, the the fresh, uh, they got refreshed, got all their hit points. Da, da, da. Now, one thing they did this time that they didn't do last time is they did go. There's a um, there's a cave a couple of miles from White Plume Mountain. I think the village is about five miles, but there's a cave 
a couple of miles from White Plume Mountain called the the Dead Knolls Eye Socket, if I remember correctly. And they left some stuff there and kind of covered up the the mouth of the cave and all that. It's kind of a well-known cave, but they still kind of barricaded it for monsters or whatever get in. They left some supplies and stuff there. And then they went to White Plume Mountain. Now they found what I did. They got back to the the, the cave that's the wizard's mouth. That's the big cave that leads to the entrance into White Plume Mountain that seems to breathe. It's like, and there's a crack at the back of the cave that, that uh, steam will blow out and then suck back in and then blow out. You gotta gotta get under that steam so you don't get scalded. What I ruled is they came back to the cave and they found it exactly as it was the first time they found it before they went to the back and mucked out the muck and mud, found the the big door with the iron ring and, and opened the door. They found it. There was no sign or indication that they had just been there, like the day before or whatever. They're like, huh. So they I didn't make them roll to find the trap door. They already knew where it's at. They found it. They got the muck cleared away. You know, they and, they and they were like, man, we need to like a demucking device. And they got the trap door open and all that. And they went down the spiral staircase. Remember the spiral spiral staircase goes a hundred feet down. It's thrumming with the constant plume steam blowing action out of the plume of the mountain, out of the cone of the mountain. It stinks, it's sulfurous, it's nasty in here. They get down to the bottom of the stairwell and they're, and they're in a foot of water all through the corridors and, and under that foot of water is a, a layer of muck. It's just nasty and their, their, their movement's reduced by a third and it's just nasty in here. It's just gross. It's sulfurous and nasty and gross and it's just not a nice place to be. So anyway, they go back down the corridor, go up north, to where it branches three ways to where the Sphinx is. And she's like, well, hello again. And, uh, you know, kind of preening herself and trying to look, you know, somewhat noble and regal in this nest. She's in a foot of water and wet and bedraggled and all this. Now the wall of force is back up. All right. Um, and oh, another thing, when they got to the bottom of that spiral staircase, the kayak wasn't there. So they got the point that the dungeon is kind of resetting a little bit. And that's not specifically in the book, but it just makes sense to me that if you, um, if there's constantly adventurers, well, not constantly, but fairly often coming in here, you know, every other adventurer that came behind them would find signs of their passage and, hey, this has already been opened. and that. But the dungeon, either, either somebody's in there, servants or something that are resetting things, or whether it's Karaptus or somebody else that's taken over the dungeon is resetting things magically, or maybe that's just part of the magic of the dungeon that it resets itself after somebody leaves. I don't know. Honestly, don't haven't puzzled that out yet. That also might be part of the end game, but that's not specifically stated in the, in the adventure. That's just how I did it. So, um, so, but they get, they're like, Oh, okay. And I think they were a little bummed to lose the kayak because the, the session before, I said you could try to take the kayak out if you want, but I mean, you got bodies, you got this, you got the other. I didn't even know about the 20, 10 foot poles, and you're trying to go up a 100 foot spiral staircase. So they said, we'll just leave the kayak at the bottom. Well, it's not there now. Where it is, is it's back in the kayak room um, where it would have been before or where they first found it. So um, that whole third, the, the northwest section that they already did, is reset. Really, the only thing different is Sir Bluto and his knights aren't there. Um, Black Razor is not there, and Quesnef's not there. But everything else is pretty much the same as it was. Uh, and the ghouls, they've killed the ghouls. But I imagine stuff kind of restocks. And somehow, I don't know how. Um, but I've even talked before that maybe the dungeon reconfigures. You know, um, I, I don't know. We'll see. Could have some fun with that in the future. Now, uh they, you know, they, they talk to the Sphinx, uh, and she's like, oh, well, you're back. Uh, you know, same same thing, answer my riddle, and you may pass. And so what I did was I uh, I found a different riddle. I, I did not want to use the same riddle that was Moon, but I wanted to find a riddle that I felt was on the same level of difficulty, kind of an interesting riddle, but not so difficult that it just stumps them and they get stuck here and they're forced to fight their way through or whatever. So here's the riddle I found, and there's all you can search for White Plume Mountain riddles. People have talked about this before and offered suggestive or suggested alternative riddles and that sort of thing. Um, I can't remember if I found this riddle there, but I, I found a couple. 
that I'm going to use. I got another one uh, that I'll use if they if they leave and come back in again. Uh, but every time they leave this area, and it may not even be they have to leave the whole uh, dungeon. They may not even have to go up the spiral spiral staircase and leave. It just could. It might be they go south past where the wall of force would normally be, and it may go back up. And to come back in, they have to do the riddle. So I'll probably rule that it's that way. So here's the riddle that I found. What has many faces but no mouths is sharper than a sword and looks splendid on any hand. So, the, you know, the party's like, oh, and they're kind of thinking it through. And they're immediately thinking jewelry because it looks splendid on a hand. And then it's got faces but no mouths. And they're like, was it a ruby? Is it this? Is it a ring? Is it a diamond ring? Is this and that? And they finally landed on diamond just because it said it's sharper than a sword. And that is the answer. It's diamond. So I'll read that to you again. It's what has many faces but no mouths, is sharper than a sword, and looks splendid on any hand. And the answer is a diamond. So, you know, the, the Sphinx was like, you may pass. Now, I should have. I didn't. Because, uh, well, next time I might because I think I watched Ethan's Antiheroes Anonymous video after I ran this session, but I like the idea of the Sphinx saying, you know, I'm going to offer you another riddle to tell you more about the dungeon, but if, you know, if you, uh, if you lose your lunch kind of thing, and I, and I may do that, so, um, I may do that next time if they leave and come back in. So anyway, they kept going, and then they had to decide which way they wanted to go. So they've already been northwest. They can go north, or they can go northeast, and what I did to prepare is I read several rooms ahead, like about three rooms ahead for each direction. Tried to be prepared and familiar with that because I'm learning. We play about two, two and a half hours during the weeknights at a game store. I'm learning that I'm, I'm kind of learning how far they'll usually make it. And I knew that they probably wouldn't make it further than two or three areas each, either way they went. So they actually chose Northeast, which is kind of a mirror image of the Northwest. Uh, you know, they both kind of go off in a diagonal. Uh, and, you know, they kind of mirror. I mean, there's a little bit of symmetry between the two Northwest, you know, the Northwest and the Northeast. But, you know, it's not exact. Uh, now, so they go Northeast and about halfway up this corridor and it's covered with water. Remember, there's a foot of water with sludge and, and whatnot. And, and about halfway up this diagonal corridor, uh, they go northeast, there's area three, which has green slime underneath the um, the water. So you can't see it. It's not on the walls, it's not on the ceiling, but it's, it's under the water. So let's take a look at green slime from the Dungeon Hazards section of the Dungeon Master's Guide from pay, on page 105. Green slime. This acidic slime devours flesh, organic material, and metal on contact. Bright green, wet, and sticky, it clings to walls, floors, and ceilings in patches. A patch of green slime covers a five-foot square, has blind sight out to a range of 30 feet, and drops from walls and ceilings when it, affects, when it detects movement below it. Beyond that, it has no ability to move. A creature aware of the slime's presence can avoid being struck by it with a successful DC-10 dexterity saving throw. Otherwise, the slime can't be avoided as it drops. A creature that comes into contact with green slime takes 5, an average of 5, 1d10 acid damage. The creature takes the damage again at the start of each of its turns, or until the slime is scraped off or destroyed. Against wood or metal, green slime deals 11 on average, 2d10 acid damage each round, and any non-magical wood or metal weapon or tool used to scrape off the slime is effectively destroyed. Sunlight. Any effect that cures disease and any effect that deals cold fire or radiant damage destroys a patch of green slime. So, um, so in this case, the rogue was a little bit ahead of the party, just a few feet ahead, and, and was taking a 10-foot pole and checking the tunnel out. And I said, describe to me exactly what you're doing. And he said, okay, well, I'm, I'm kind of feeling around under the water. And then I, you know, kind of tap the walls in the ceiling, and then I move forward and repeat kind of thing. You just kind of tap, 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 tap. Now, so what I did was uh, I gave him, when he came to the green slime, I gave him a, a perception check 
not a passive perception check, because remember, because he's, he's specifically looking for danger, to see the green slime that came up on the end of his pole, because he's like, tap, 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 and then he's about to go to the wall, and he made the perception check. I think I didn't make it very hard. I think I made it like a 10, kind of average. And I was like, whoa, there's something on the end of your pole, and it's like green slime, and it's eating the end of your pole. And he lost about a foot of his collapsible 10-foot pole. He's like, oh, man. So anyway, you know, they're looking. Now, remember, there's no green slime on the walls of the ceiling here. It's just under the water, right? So, um, you know, because I, I think I've listened to Let's – sometimes I watch other people play – through White Flu Mountain or other adventures I'm running to kind of get ideas or to get prepared. And I've seen people do it where even in this area, they had it falling from the ceilings or off the walls. And that's not the case here. So the sorcerer kind of wants to move forward and, um, and kind of check things out and try to take care of the green slime. Now there's going to be right here in the video, there's going to be a continuity change to where there's more light behind me in the window because I recorded all this earlier and and for some reason, my video editing software lost the first 40 something minutes. And uh, and so I'm, I had to re-record everything, but we're gonna take up with what I recorded uh, from that point forward. So this is what happened next when the sorcerer kind of steps forward and he said, oh, I wanna, uh, I wanna go five feet in front of where the green slime was found, is where he wants to go. And so he walks out in front of the rogue, and I said, okay, well, so you're standing there, and all of a sudden you started feeling intense burning in your feet. I said, what kind of, you know, shoes do you have on? He's like, you know, the sorcerer's like basically just kind of regular kind of cloth boot kind of things, leather boots, something. And I'm like, well, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're feeling an intense pain in your, in your feet. And he's like, what? But I, and, and so he said, he was telling me that it was, you know, like he was saying five feet in front of the rogue and I interpreted it as five feet out from where the green slime was found or something like that. And he, it didn't matter either way. Um, he probably would have walked into the slime, but it's one of the, it was one of those moments where I literally, I didn't go, I wasn't going out of my way to get the player, but based on how he described what he would do to me, I'm like, okay, he's going to step into green slime because he said five feet out from where it was found. But I think in his mind, and I, I explained this, opposite the first time I brought this up a moment ago in his mind he meant five feet in front of the rogue in my mind it was like well you want to go out five feet in front of where it was found so either way he probably still would have stepped in to some green slime so he's like oh he backs up he gets healed they throw minor restoration on him to get rid of the slime on his feet and all that and um, so what they decided to do was the sorcerer wanted to throw burning hands to, to kill the slime, which I was fine with, but what I ruled, remember, it's a 20-foot patch of green slime, um, and, and normally Burning Hands has a, has a range of 15 feet kind of out in a fan, and I said, well, since there's a foot of water over the slime, it's going to reduce the effective range of, of your Burning Hands to 10, because, you know, some of the energy of Burning Hands is being used up to bubble down and burn through the water, and all of that, but I still rule, you know, he basically did an application of burning hands, um, and they move forward, found another, you know, 10 feet down, found some more green slime, he did it again, so he did two burning hands, he got rid of the green slime, um, so that, that's how they handled that challenge, um, and, you know, another thing, they were very clear, they, they were looking on the ceilings and the walls after they realized that green slime was, in the, and I said, there's none up there, you know, so you might rule there's green slime up there. I think I watched a Let's Play where they put some green slime up on the ceiling or on the walls to make it more of a challenge. But I just kept it, you know, as written under the water. Now, the next thing they went into, and this is a very interesting room. Uh, I think this is another one of those kind of famous rooms. Really, this whole dungeon is kind of famous. Uh, not kind of famous. It is famous. But they went into Area 5, and the green slime is considered Area 3 by the rules, but they went into area five. Now, uh, they ended up going north. They came to a branch in the map and they ended up going north when they could have kind of gone south. They go south, they go to room four, which is this very interesting uh, room that has a bunch of glass globes in it, kind of a trap, but they didn't go that way yet. Maybe they'll go that way on the way back. They went up north and they came to, to door or to room five. And five is where there's a bunch of, there's five numbered flesh golems in here 
but the door is closed that leads in here. So there is a door. They come to a door. The wa there's still water along the floor. They're, they're still in the water area. They're getting closer to getting out of the water. But, and like I said, this roughly kind of mirrors to a point uh, the Northwest version, you know, tunnel. It kind of branches off, and there's a little bit of, you know, symmetry between how the dungeon goes. It's not exact. But anyway, they go up north, and this is roughly where they would have fought the goal or the the ghouls when they went through the northwest area going towards Black Razor. But there's they came to a door. The rogue checked it out. There's no traps or anything like that. The rogue did a string check, opened the door, and the fighter that has Black Razor specifically said, I pushed the rogue into the room. And I said, I said, are you joking? He said, no, I really do that. And there was, it was kind of a joking interplay between the two players, but he said, no, I really do that. I said, okay. So the rogue goes into the room. Now everybody else is still behind him. And here's the numbered golem room. Uh, five flesh golems are clustered against the north wall. Each has a number on its chest. Five, seven, nine, eleven, and thirteen. Now, you could do it, you could make it that it's painted on. I made it, it was kind of stitched in flesh. But you know, you could do make how I don't know how the numbers are on the golem. They or golems, they just are. It doesn't really say. Um, number five says one of us does not belong with the others. If you could pick it out, it will serve you, and the others will allow you passage. If you pick the wrong one, we will kill you. You have 60 seconds. Now, the game, or the book says the correct choice is nine because it is not a prime number. Give the players an actual 60 seconds to figure it out. So, if the, if the characters give the wrong answer, roll initiative. The golems lumber forward to confront the intruders. If the characters answer the riddle correctly... It, it happens like the golem said, the golem number nine becomes an ally of the party. It just kind of follows the party around. I guess does what it tells them to do. So here's what happened. The rogue got pushed in, and he's looking around, he sees the golems, and immediately, you know, one of us does not belong with the others. If you can pick it out, it will serve you, and the others will allow you passage. If you pick the wrong one, we will kill you. You have 60 seconds. And I said very clearly... I was as clear as I could be with the party on this, the group. I looked around and said, okay, right now, at this very second, only the rogue knows what's going on. Only the rogue has really heard the riddle. I said, None, nobody else can participate yet. I said, he's very specifically been pushed in there. And so, you know, because the player, all the players are trying to figure out the riddle. And now if everybody had walked in there, I would have let anybody shout out an answer. But instead, they specifically said, you know, the rogue's in there while they're all... So I let it unfold that way. I had one player about to give the... And I said, nope, nope, it's just the rogue. I was really clear. And then another player is like about to... And not only did I to that player say, no, it's just the rogue right now, but the other player that I had just said, Shh, also looked at that player and said, no, don't say anything yet. And that player that we both said, no, 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 don't do it yet, blurted out the answer, which is nine. And I'm like... I stood back and I'm like, what do I do here? Because, I, I mean, I super clearly said, don't do this. And I even said, I was just caught off guard and I said, how could you, how could you do that? I just said, don't do that. It's like, man, I'm sorry. I just started panicking and, you know, I got excited and threw the answer out and everything. So I'm like, oh, I'm trying to think what to do as a DM here. How to, how to keep this room challenging, but yet stick to the parameters that I just established. So I said, okay. I said, guys, here's what I'm going to do. I said, the answer is nine. It's spoiled now. Um, you know, because the player even said nine because it's not a prime number. You know, gave the riddle away. I said, okay. I said, I'm going to make it a random. It's one of the numbers randomly. Rogue, what are you going to choose? And I chose 11. The rogue shouted out 13. And I said, nope, they're they're moving in for attack. Let's all roll initiative. Now, game-wise, the way I here's, I said, here's what happened. This trap in this dungeon has been around so long that, like, there's a fault in the system, if you will, with that, that puzzle. Now, on one hand, you know, I wanted to kind of be like, look, I, I, can't, I can't let people blurt stuff out when I've said specifically don't. I mean, the player who blurted stuff out, Admit, he said, man, I'm so sorry. He felt really bad. 
It's like I just got panicked, this and that and the other. But at the same time, I've got to, like I clearly said, here's the parameters of what's going to happen. So I, I don't, I, you know, I wasn't, I, I'm not hard on myself for, for changing the dynamic of the riddle. I wish I'd have come up with something on the spot that would have still been a mental puzzle and a calculation to give the rogue a fair chance of answering it without just saying, you know, what do I have in my pocket? What's the, just randomly name a number. What I should have done is pick two numbers. And that would have given them a, uh, see, it's 20, 40. That would have given them a 40% chance of getting it right. Instead, they only had a 20%. Well, they really had a 40% chance because you could assume that they knew it wasn't going to be nine. I said, pick a number. So they knew it wasn't nine. That leaves them four numbers left to choose from. Um, you know, and then and I chose 13. They chose 11. But I had the golems activate. I know that I didn't do that perfectly. I'd love to hear your comments on how you would have handled that. And remember, you're in the moment. You're trying to keep things moving. You didn't say, hold on a second, and walk out of the room and think for five minutes and come back. You know, so you, the people watching this, you have the uh, hindsight is 2020, just like I do. But think about it. You're in the moment. You're like, you're a little frustrated. Let's be honest. You're like, I just, and then you're trying to tone yourself down so that you're not giving somebody a hard time. And what would you have done? Spur the moment. To, to, to move that forward if the riddle was ruined by, you know, a player just not having self-control at the moment. So anyway, they fought the golems. It was a good fight. They defeated the golems. The rogue was unhappy that, A, he got pushed in there, and, B, he really wanted a golem familiar, basically, to follow him around. So he was upset about that. Um, and and there was stuff came out. This was the same player, different character, that in Out of the Abyss really wanted to keep the dragon egg. And didn't get to keep the dragon egg. So he's like, I didn't get the dragon egg. I didn't get my golem. You know, so he's he's being pretty funny. But nobody was upset. And we made sure after the battle, which was a pretty good battle. It was a fun battle. The golems are pretty tough. Uh, you know, read up on the golems. They get two attacks. Uh, they get two melee attacks. They're very immune and resistant to a whole lot of different stuff. Armor class is low. High hit points. But, you know, in the right circumstances, they could be pretty deadly. Um so, so any, <laughs> anyway, uh, that, that's how that room went. And and afterwards, I mean, all of us as a group were like, you know, loving on, on the guy that, that blurted out the answer. She's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, dude, seriously, don't, t- it's, it's not that big of a deal. I said, we've all been there. Uh, I said, you know, we love you. And it was like, oh, we love you and clap. And, you know, so we gave him, I guess, positive, you know, hey, this isn't that big of a deal. You know, it's not like you've, you're have you ostracized or anything like that. That stuff's going to happen. Uh, but I, I do have to admit, my initial reaction was pretty irritated and frustrated. But I got over it pretty quick, and I tried my darndest to keep it fun and not give him a hard time. And, and I think that's how it came off. So we also ruled... Uh, that and, and this is I don't know if this is technically by the rules the right way to go, but it seemed the right way to do with me. Uh, the flesh golems, I said they didn't have souls for the purposes of Black Razor eating souls. Uh, and Black Razor was even complaining to the character, not the player, character Uzumaki, that there were perfectly good souls in the room, but he was being wasted on constructs. Of course, talking about the other party members. He's like, there's perfectly good souls. They move forward. Uh, they moved through that room after defeating the golems. There was, you know, there was some searching of the golems and that there's nothing on the golems. There's no treasure in this room. Um, they went through the, the North door. They opened up that door, went up and it's another one of those things where there's some stair, stair steps going up out of the water. So they're, they're back on dry corridor. And then there's a turnstile, just like a, like in a subway or something or at a ball game or something where you can go through this turnstile one way but you can't come back the other way and they're looking at this turnstile to move forward in the tunnel but tunnel tunnel the tunnel but they haven't gone through it yet and that's where we ended so thanks so much for watching i love your questions and comments please leave the video a thumbs up maybe a comment on youtube subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and we will catch you next time with white plume mountain on shane place